Well, today, we're going to think about the fact that God is real. He is there, and he is not silent. We learned yesterday that Daniel and his friends at university stood the test and proved that they were capable of standing for God against the background of the materialistic ideology of the Babylonians, as students, that is. And now in the junior stage of their administrative jobs, this is going to be put to the test. And we're going to read some verses at the beginning of Daniel chapter 2. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation. The Chaldeans answered them the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed in a vision of the night to Daniel. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven and answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. To whom belong wisdom and might, he changes times and seasons, he removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and now have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have, been, you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. 
He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen in its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter day. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he saw a colossal man. It was very strange, slightly surreal, because its head was made of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its stomach and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet. They were the most curious of all because they seemed to be made of a strange mixture of iron and ceramics, substances that do not naturally mix. And that, of course, meant as he watched that this colossal man, though very impressive, was inherently unstable because of the weakness of its feet. And as in his dream he watched, a stone suddenly appeared which smashed the feet of the colossus so that it collapsed and crumbled to dust. But the stone grew and grew until it filled the entire earth. And terrified by the nightmare, Nebuchadnezzar woke up in a cold sweat. He was scared to death, of course he was. What could the dream mean? Because as an ancient oriental, he felt that the dreams were portents from the gods. And he needed to know what it meant, so he called his experts. Those ancient equivalents of our think tanks or forecasting institutes who study global and political and economic trends to help formulate advice for their leaders. In ancient lands like Babylon, many of these experts were astrologers involved in the dubious shadow lands between astronomy and the occult. And we should not be ignorant of the fact that such people still play an important role in many countries, even in the West. Nebuchadnezzar told these men that he wanted to know two things. Firstly, he insisted on knowing what he dreamed. And secondly, what the dream meant. This threw them into complete consternation because they were used hitherto to interpreting something placed in front of them. But to be asked first to tell the king what he had dreamed, such a thing was unprecedented. And it was very troubling. For they were bright enough to see that Nebuchadnezzar was now for the first time probing their claim to be able to give genuine interpretation. Were they really in touch with the gods as they claimed to be? Were they actually delivering the goods? Or were they bluffers? And now he'd left no room for guesswork. It was far too risky to guess. And so they got into a very tight corner indeed and they began to move their necks as their heads began to feel a little bit unseated as perhaps they would be in just a few hours. So they asked Nebuchadnezzar again to tell them the dream. And they would interpret it. He said, no, you tell me the dream. He wanted to know if they really were in contact with a supernatural source of information. And of course he was reluctant to tell them what was in the dream. Wouldn't you have been? He saw in the dream a colossal man toppled. And of course the first thing you would think of is himself. 
Was this a portent that his empire was going to be finished? And just imagine if he had told his experts what had happened. It would immediately caused a cabal to form and the intrigue would have grown until the very thing that Nebuchadnezzar had seen would be brought into reality by some of the people that wanted him unseated. A palace coup would have ensued very rapidly. So he didn't tell them what it was. And now their heads felt even more uncomfortable because the king wasn't for compromise. And so they said to him, look, this is unprecedented, your majesty. No king has ever asked anything like this before. And in any case, there's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And here is an admission coming from 26 centuries ago, that these men who claimed to be in touch with the supernatural dimension had no touch with it whatsoever. Nebuchadnezzar was furious. And he commanded them all to be executed. And he was so mad that he extended the order, presumably to people like Daniel and the others who weren't even at the meeting. Because Daniel, the first thing he hears of it is when the captain of the guard comes and tells him. And here Daniel steps in and gently to assuage the man's anger in carrying out the wrath of the king. He says, I would like to speak to the king. And asked for time. At that stage he didn't know. That he would get the answer. It's a remarkable step of faith for a man in his early 20s isn't it? He knew though. That God had given him a remarkable ability. Because we're told at the end of chapter 1. That he was gifted at the interpretation of dreams. And so he put his life on the line and said, give me time. I like to imagine him going back to his home and gathering his three friends together, scarcely older than students, in this polytheistic land and saying to the men, our lives are on the line. We need to pray that God in heaven will reveal the mystery to us. And notice the way it's phrased. He told them to seek mercy from the God in heaven. And that tells us the profound difference between Nebuchadnezzar's experts, brilliant as they were, they didn't believe that there was any other world beyond this one. But Daniel did. He believed there was another world. He believed there was a God. There was a God in heaven. This universe was not all that there was. And that is precisely the clash that is tearing its way through our Western society today. Think of them, those four. In a kind of a graduate student prayer meeting. Asking God to reveal to them what the king had dreamt. And God did so in a vision in the night. God is there and he is not silent. He answered their prayer and Daniel prayed and he was so full of joy. As he worshipped the God to whom belongs wisdom and might who changes times and seasons and who removes kings and sets up kings and he thrilled with the knowledge of in his heart that he was in touch with the central throne of the universe. 
And he praised the God who'd revealed deep and hidden things, who knows what's in the dark and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might. Daniel was no fool. There's no mock modesty here. He knew he was exceptional. But simultaneously, he knew that these abilities had been given to him. And that is so very important, isn't it? Daniel's attitude to his own abilities is a theme that runs through this book. He never became an intellectual idolater, worshipping his own abilities. He accepted them as from God, as gifts. And he was clever enough to see that gifts and character aren't the same thing. So often we get ourselves into petty squabbles over our abilities. A jealousy and envy come. But that won't happen if we realize that we have nothing that we haven't been given. As Paul so many centuries later was to say, who are we? All we've got is what we've been given. And our character doesn't depend on our gifts. And so for each of us, whether we're as brilliant as Daniel or not, what's open to us is the development of character and integrity and moral fiber. It's not open to all of us to be like Daniel was. And Daniel knew exactly what his position was and thanked God for making known to him the dream of the king. And so he goes to Ariok. And he knows that now he's in possession of almost unlimited power. He's not a fool. He knows that the knowledge in his possession is of incalculable value. And he also knows that a single word from him and all those bogus men all the charlatans who'd been sucking up to Nebuchadnezzar and draining his cash resources, pretending to be able to read the stars. He could have them destroyed like that and remove any potential rivalry, any potential attempt to unseat him like that. And he doesn't do it. The first thing he ensures is the protection of the men that would later try to destroy him. That's magnificent, isn't it? This is real tolerance. He disagreed with them. But because of his values, he saw that they were men and women made in the image of God, so he would protect their right to exist. And protecting the right to exist and function of those who disagree with you is a very important thing. And that very phrase, protect the right to exist, is a phrase that echoes at many levels in our society, doesn't it? What a strange society we are. That once a baby is born, its right to exist is protected, but before it's born... What anomalies ripple through our lawmaking. Daniel protected these men. Don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, let them be, let them go. Bring me into the king. And Arioch rushes into the king. You can see that sense of haste and says, I found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. And now Daniel stands in that colossal throne room in Babylon, the biggest in the ancient world. Possibly he had chained lions around the throne just to remind people of his prestige. And here's a young Hebrew standing in the highest situation in the ancient world, talking to the most powerful man in the world, 
and knowing that he's got that man in his hand. There are very few situations in history like it, you know. There's only one that I can really think of, and that is the case of Joseph before the Egyptian pharaoh, and possibly Nehemiah before the king. But even in secular history, taking all of history together, this is an unprecedented moment. And the king, perhaps slightly cynically, says, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel, in very measured words, I can imagine he was nervous. He doesn't say, I am, O king. No, no. He says, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. None of us can, but there is a God in heaven. Wouldn't you love to have been there? The courage to stand before this man and flying in the face of all his crass idolatry to claim there is a God in heaven. And that's what you and I are called to do in our 21st century society today. At whatever level. To claim it and to claim it credibly. Because Daniel didn't just claim it. He had evidence to prove that it was real and the evidence would soon come. But he was going to focus Nebuchadnezzar's mind not on himself and his own ability, but the existence of God who speaks and a God who reveals. Yet took courage. Because you see, how was Daniel to know his interpretation was right? They'd had it in a vision of the night, but how could you be sure? How could you be certain that it was right? You see, it's very easy for us with hindsight to imagine it was very simple. But somehow Daniel had the certainty that what he had seen was right. There is a God of heaven, and he has made known to Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. And so he interpreted the dream. The colossal man with its different metals represented four world empires that would reign on the earth. Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom were the head of gold. And after him, there would be another kingdom. In fact, as we learn later in the book itself, the Medo-Persian kingdom. Then there would be a third kingdom, the kingdom of Greece, and a fourth, the kingdom of Rome. But the stone would smash the image. That would be another kingdom altogether. It would be set up directly by God. It would stand forever. And Daniel's final point to Nebuchadnezzar was this. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation sure. And Nebuchadnezzar was so overwhelmed with it that he promoted Daniel to be ruler over the whole province of Babylon. What's it all about? So let's now go down and analyze what's going on in all of this. Firstly, we see that the wise men of Babylon were forced to admit that they did not believe in revelation. They were prepared to use their reason on the content of the dream if Nebuchadnezzar would only reveal it to them. But logic will tell you that no matter how clever they were, if he wasn't prepared to tell them, who could? And they were forced to see 
that revelation was in a completely different category from human reason. Unaided reason was powerless to access the information they needed. They believed in gods, but only in gods who were remote, whose dwelling place, quote, is not with human beings. That is, their worldview had no room for revelation. And so they felt that Nebuchadnezzar's demand was unreasonable. No king ever demanded such a thing of his advisors because that would mean, your majesty, that revelation actually occurred. And we all know that's absurd. And you could hear it echoing down into the theological faculties around the world today, can't you? We even find it among biblical scholars who query the dating of this book to the 6th century BC because they say Daniel couldn't possibly have written the book at the time of the Babylonian and beginning of the Medo-Persian empires. Why not? Because in chapter 11, he gives this very detailed description, accurate description of history that happened long after his time. And so they say he must have lived in the second century BC, since otherwise he wouldn't have known the history of the period to write it down. In other words, they don't believe in revelation. Isn't it interesting? I remember once giving lectures on this book in front of some very learned theological students. And they got very annoyed as I was going through the talks and eventually they delegated a spokesman. And he came up and he said, we're all a bit disappointed in these lectures on Daniel. I said, oh, why is that? Well, you haven't dealt with a fundamental issue. And what's that? And so they detailed to me the thing that I've just mentioned. Are you going to deal with it? I said, yes, of course, when Daniel gets round to dealing with it himself. Oh, they said, does he deal with it himself? And so I pointed out that this chapter two is in two halves. The second half, which fascinates most people, is the interpretation of the dream. But the first half is equally important. And it talks about this question does revelation exist or not? And when I discussed that in some detail, they said, well, we didn't learn that in our lectures at Tübingen. And I said, I wonder why. It's so easy, you see, to have a preconceived materialistic closed world view that thinks of this world as a closed system of cause and effect. And there is no God who can speak, there is no revelation. And I find it not more than interesting that Daniel himself deals with this question in detail because such materialistic thinkers existed in plenty in Babylon. They weren't an invention of the 20th century. What is the difference between reason and revelation? At the end of chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar, in his oral examination of these students, discovered they were ten times better than everybody else. So that's it, you say. These were relatively brilliant people, but it was only relative. Is that all there is to it? That they were bright, full stop? No, it isn't. So chapter 2 is now taking the logic of the argument further. And raising the question, is there a source of information beyond that which is accessible to unaided human reason? And it answers the question with a resounding yes. There is a God who reveals secrets. Now that's an extremely important idea. Because it has implications at a much lower level. And that much more lower level has to do with the nature of science. Because today our materialistic worldview is increasingly leading scientists to think that science is the only way to truth. It's not just that reason's the only way to truth. It's that science is the only way to truth. Of course, if that were so, it would close half the departments in our universities straight away. Because science cannot tell you whether a poem is a good poem or a bad poem. Science can tell you that if you put arsenic in your grandmother's tea, it'll give her an uncomfortable day. 
but it can't tell you whether you ought to do it or not to get your hands on its money. Even Richard Dawkins admits that it's very difficult to get ethics from science. So we see at once that science is limited, but because science is so authoritative in our culture, there is this increasing emphasis on what we call scientism. Science is the only way to truth. And I want to say just a little bit about it before returning to the higher level of reason and revelation. Science is the only way to truth. Well, that's nonsense, of course, to start with, because that statement is not a statement of science. So if science is the only way to truth, since that statement is not a statement of science, it cannot be true, can it? I think this is too early in the morning for that kind of logic, isn't it? <laughs> Putting it another way, Bertrand Russell once said, what science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know. Well, think about it. That's not a statement of science, so we can't know it. So if it's true, it's false. <laughs> Have you got it now? What we call that is logical incoherence. And it's what you discover when you try to go too far. Science is limited. And to use my well-worn analogy of Aunt Matilda and her cake, if you've all won the Nobel Prize and Aunt Matilda's here with her cake and you analyze it for me in terms of elements and elementary particles, and you're all brilliant being Nobel Prize winners, and I finally ask you, why did she make the cake? You'll never be able to tell even if you put her brain under a brain scan. In fact, you'll not be able to tell unless she reveals it to you. Now, think carefully at this point. If Aunt Matilda reveals to you why she made the cake, do you shut off your reason? Of course not. You have to use your reason to understand what she's saying. Your reason, unaided, cannot get at what's in her brain before she says it. But once she says it, your reason doesn't close down. Of course not. You've got to use your reason, one, to understand what she says, and two, to see if it makes sense. Now let's bump this up to the higher level. Reason and revelation do not contradict each other. The new atheists tell us all the time that they do. They don't. They're not even in the same category. And I find it most helpful to think of this in terms of sources of information. Nature is a fascinating source of inf uh, information. And we use our reason in science and in other ways to probe it. But there's another source of information. That is the basic Christian claim. This is the word of God. It is a source of information. You couldn't get it using your unaided reason. But once you've got it, do you shut down your reason? Well, I don't know about you, but I've never yet met a person that can read and understand the Bible without using their mind. Have you? It's absurdity to say that reason and revelation are, are opposed. And it's completely false and an insult both to God and the Bible. Because the trouble is, ladies and gentlemen, there's been a filtering off of a fuzzy concept of all of these ideas that's seeped through into certain aspects of Christian thinking so that people end up being anti-intellectual. And that is a very serious insult to the God who designed the human mind. Let's be very careful, especially those of us who have been gifted and given an education that we don't slip into the shoddiness of allowing our secular education to rocket ahead and remaining children when it comes to scripture. That's a sure way to being totally silent as far as the public square is concerned. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, says by the Bible, as well as with your heart. It's not either or. The eagle needs two wings to fly on. 
And it needs to appeal both to the heart and to the mind in order to be credible. And so the very big issue of this chapter is this. There is a God that reveals secrets. Now let's look at it another way from the perspective of the way the New Testament analyzes it. The Apostle Peter comments on what prophecy is. And this is the first bit of prophecy in Daniel. And in his second letter, in chapter 1, he says, We have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand. That's a very strong statement. You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You see, these experts in Nebuchadnezzar's think tank believed in private analysis as the source of information. They took what they could see in history and in economics and in their culture and they analyzed it and they came to their conclusions and made their predictions. What Peter is saying here that no prophecy was ever like that. It's not a result of brilliant analysis using unaided human reason. It originates in another world. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God didn't override their personalities or their abilities. But there is a supernatural dimension to it. It's not private analysis. Do we believe that there is such a God? That there is such a supernatural dimension? Do we? It's utterly absurd to believe it, you know, in the eyes of the new atheists. I had a recent conversation with Richard Dawkins, and you can find it on his website. And he thinks that I've completely delivered myself into his hands because I've actually stated that I believed in the resurrection, that I believed in the incarnation, the virgin birth, and the miracles of Jesus. And Dawkins calls it on his website pure gold. Why does he look at it like that? Because it proves I'm a lunatic. (laughs) That I've set myself free from any pretension to be a rational 21st century human being. Ladies and gentlemen, it's serious this, because that's exactly what an increasing number of people believe. And you may feel at the moment protected from it because you've got sufficient people around you who believe that these things are true, but the wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. How do you think I feel as an academic at the University of Oxford being described by its world-famous professor? Like that? You think that's some kind of a joke? Well, if you think that, you're very mistaken. This is a battle for worldview. And why is it I don't think I'm an idiot believing these things? Well, the reason Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and the rest of them think I am is because David Hume so long ago said, miracles are violations of the laws of nature and they're therefore essentially impossible. And that influence of the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher has meant that so many people refuse now at this point 
to grant any more credibility to what the Bible says. David Hume was wrong. It's a fairly strong statement. Peace be to all you Scots here. David Hume was wrong on this point. Miracles are not violations of the laws of nature at all. What are the laws of nature? Are they causes? No. Newton's laws of motion have never set a billiard ball moving in the whole history of the universe. They'll describe the motion once you've hit the ball. The laws are descriptions of what normally happens and enable us, because this universe has got regularities, to make predictions. And that's what confirms those laws. But I believe that behind those laws there's a lawgiver and he's built a moderately stable universe which can be described by those laws. But because God himself is not a prisoner of those laws, there's nothing to stop him feeding something new into the system. It doesn't break any laws. Let me try to explain that to you. Perhaps part of the difficulty is with the word law. We use it in two senses in popular language. We use it in the sense of the laws of the land and the laws of nature. Let me try to illustrate the difference. And here, of course, I'm indebted to C.S. Lewis. He said, you put 200 pounds plus 200 pounds into your drawer tonight. That's 400 pounds. You wake up in the morning and you find there are just 50 pounds in your drawer. What do you conclude? That the laws of arithmetic have been broken? No, you conclude that the laws of Northern Ireland have been broken. <laughs> and why do you conclude that the laws of Northern Ireland have been broken? Because you know the laws of arithmetic. That's why. You see, if you didn't know the law of arithmetic, 2 plus 2 equals 4, you would say, well, 2 plus 2 equals 4 today, it equals 50 tomorrow, 200 plus 200. But it's because you know the regularity that you recognize that somebody's put their hand into the system. Now let's think of what that means. It's a very simple illustration. I find that even professors can understand it. <laughs> the laws of nature are descriptions of regularities. Now here's the point. If we didn't know the regularities, we couldn't recognize a miracle. How could we? If you didn't know that dead people usually stay dead and don't rise, you wouldn't recognize a resurrection as a miracle. And Hume and others thought that the people who wrote the Bible were pre-scientific and didn't understand the laws of nature. That's rubbish, of course. They were pre-scientific in the historical sense. They existed before modern science. But Joseph knew exactly where babies come from. And so when Mary said she was pregnant, he didn't believe her. Not because he didn't know the laws, but because he did. He recognized that something special had happened. And in the end, he accepted it. The man born blind that John tells us about, he knew that people born blind didn't get their sight. And so he said from the beginning of the world, it's never been heard that somebody got, who was born blind got their sight. He knew the norm, and so he could recognize the miracle. Because God had done something special. That's very important. To really let it sink down into our heads. That we're not insulting our intelligence when we believe that there is a God in heaven. There is a supernatural dimension. And God can, if he wills, feed something in. And our knowledge of the regularities is a thing that helps us see that this is utterly special. And that is one of the reasons I believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he rose from the dead. Because the evidence is there. To say that miracles violate the laws of nature is simply absurd. That's the first half of chapter 2. I'm changing the proportions a bit from the normal, as you see. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes on the second half, because presumably you know all about it. 
Daniel interprets the dream. And now we observe Nebuchadnezzar's learning process that is eventually going to lead to him coming to believe in the reality of this God in heaven and to know something about him. So Daniel describes this image to him. And of course, the moment Daniel starts, Nebuchadnezzar is riveted because he knows that Daniel knows. And Daniel knows that Nebuchadnezzar knows that Daniel knows. And so with immense authority, Daniel can take his time to explain what's going on. This was the dream, said Daniel. Now he will tell the king of his, its interpretation. You, O king, are king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into his hand he has given wherever they dwell the children of men, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. What a compressed lesson that was. I'm sure they must have discussed it over the ensuing weeks. You are king of kings. And you've been given it, Nebuchadnezzar. Just imagine telling Nebuchadnezzar that he wasn't the source of his own ability. He was to make that mistake later in chapter 4 because it took a long process for him to get away from his thinking. Nebuchadnezzar, here you sit before me. I've been given wisdom and I'm using it to talk to you. You've been given immense authority. And now we see something very interesting. You, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. Is that God's opinion, really? Daniel's often described as apocalyptic literature. And it is in a sense, but we need to be careful because it's no usual apocalypse. Because apocalypses usually are stark. All in the world is doom and gloom. It needs to be removed and replaced. It's not quite that. The origin of this dream was God. So by definition, it's God's comment on these world empires and the different metals represent different values. And that raises all kinds of fascinating questions for historians, sociologists, and political scientists. What are these values? What are the differences? You're the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. There was something glorious about Nebuchadnezzar's rule in God's eyes. After you will arise a kingdom inferior to you. I admire Daniel's courage in telling Nebuchadnezzar there'd be something after him. It hadn't exactly occurred to Nebuchadnezzar before. <laughs> There'll be a kingdom inferior to you. In what sense? And so the image is beginning to invite Nebuchadnezzar to think about the nature and quality of his rule because rule in world history hasn't been all equal, has it? And that means as Christians we can be thankful for the progress that's been made. My children, when we lived in Wales, didn't have to go down the mines at the age of 10. Why is that? because there have been some much more fair laws developed. You know, the laws of our country are so important. We need to pray for people involved in the shaping of law, because they affect us all in such subtle ways, and we must give thanks to God for every improvement. But the crucial lesson of this image was, one, God is the source of power. Two, Nebuchadnezzar, there's going to be an after you. Your tenure of power is limited, so be careful what you do with it. Three, there are different values embedded in the ideologies of different empires. Nebuchadnezzar, think through your values. We'll have to see that he came unstuck on precisely that area a little bit later. And then finally, Nebuchadnezzar. No empire is absolute value. That's why they all have to be destroyed. Because after all, what are you, Nebuchadnezzar? You're a man. 
and you've seen your empire as the head of a colossal man and it's a man with flawed feet and that has come into our own language into the expression he has feet of clay flawed and the flaws in human nature project themselves upwards into leadership as we know so well in our world of today as we look at the Zimbabwe's of this world flawed and ultimately needing to be replaced and so Nebuchadnezzar saw the stone that would come crashing down and replace the whole image and he learned a lesson that a whole lot of people have never learned the stone was cut out without hands a biblical expression meaning it was of supernatural origin. And you notice it wasn't part of the image. It wasn't that. World politics gets so infected positively with Christian teaching that ultimately it turns into in some evolutionary process the kingdom of God. No. The kingdom of God, when it ultimately comes, comes as a stone crashing out of that other realm. And what is the stone? In Luke chapter 20, Jesus looked directly at the crowd and he asked, what is the meaning of that which has been written? The stone that the builders have rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. And let's end on this magnificent note of hope. The colossal image was impressive, but it was unstable. It's going to ultimately be replaced by something utterly stable. Behold, I lay in Zion, says Scripture, a cornerstone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie, and water will overflow your hiding place. That's an analysis of this image, isn't it? Oh, the lies that govern our world on times. The injustice. One day the stone's going to come and remove all those things that cause instability in our world. But you know, Daniel and his friends, where did they get their courage from? They were already standing on the stone. Are you? Because if you're standing on the stone, you can trust and you will never be put to shame. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the authority of your word as it comes to us in its power and reminds us that there is another world. And we pray that as we reflect at the end of this talk that we will ask ourselves where we stand amidst all the instability that surrounds us and indeed in the instabilities and the flaws in our own personalities and characters. Help us to stand consciously and firmly on the stone. Do we hear your word tell us what has happened to us if we are Christians? That we're living stones. And we've come to the chief cornerstone and been built up in him. 
Father, we pray that you'll help us all to so stand. The people will take us seriously when we say there is a God in heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.